or cuts off or anything, you know, just jump on and, and let me know. Okay, uh, for questions, I'm gonna ask people to put them in the chat um, and then I can try and interrupt you if they're urgent or you can break in places or. Yeah, I, I've, I've scheduled a couple of places to break. Um, Great. But you know, if it's urgent, they can they just raise it straight away. Okay. Sounds good. Um, and you did your PhD at the National University of Singapore. You did a postdoc at NIST, and then you went back to the National University of Singapore. That's, That's right. Excellent. All right, we're gonna give people another minute to hop on. Sorry, and I'm also trying to figure out how to do this YouTube thing. All right, we can get started. We are recording uh, on Zoom and we're live on YouTube. So anyone on the Zoom meeting, um, if you turn on your voice or your video, you'll be on YouTube. Um, so uh, we are pleased today to have Alex Ling joining us from Singapore. And thank you, Alex, for staying up late um, to give us this seminar. Uh, Alex did his PhD at the National University of Singapore. Then he came and did a postdoc at NIST in Gaithersburg. And then he went back to the National University of Singapore where he started a group uh, investigating uh, quantum communication in particular space-based um, quantum communication. And so he is going to tell us today all about that. But before he starts, just a reminder, next week we are back to our normal time um, and we are gonna be hearing from Mohamed Hafezi from the University of Maryland. So thanks Alex, go ahead. Thanks, Elizabeth. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so first of all, um, you know, if the voice or, or video cuts out, just jump on and, and let me know that there's a problem. Um, I've also scheduled, you know, some breaks during the talk so people can ask questions. Uh, I typically don't monitor the chat when I'm when I'm speaking. So if there's anything urgent, just just jump on and let me know. So um, <clears throat> what I'm going to talk about today is. Um, some of our you know, results that we have obtained from our small satellite, um, Spooky One, uh, that's been in space for more than 600 days now. So in this picture over here, what you're looking at is you're looking at Spooky One, which is this shoebox size satellite uh, as it leaves the deployer on the International Space Station. Um, and this happened um, in 2021, in the middle of 2021. Uh, and we have been operating the satellite since then. Uh, and collecting data. So I'm gonna you know, share our perspectives and experience about how we actually build the experiment that, that went onto the satellite. Uh, what are some of the results that we've seen? Uh, I'll share with you some of the latest results that we've uh, been studying, uh, which we just you know, collected uh, like over a month ago. Uh, and then I'll close out with some perspectives of the kinds of experiments um, I think that we can look forward to uh, in the next few years. Okay, so let's move on. So for those of you who are not from a quantum background, you might be wondering why do we call the satellite spooky? Uh, and it's a bit of an insider joke. Um, 
it's you know makes reference to a statement that Einstein made uh, to Max Born back in the day when he said that you know he was puzzled by the strong correlations between quantum systems that are entangled, and he called this correlations spooky action in the distance. Now, um, for those of you who are not familiar, my research team, um, we are a small group at the National University of Singapore. Uh, we're housed in the Center for Quantum Technologies. And this is the, the last uh, iteration of the team just before Spooky was actually deployed uh, to the space station. Um, we are standing on the rooftop of our uh, UHF radio receiver. Uh, and you know, from the roof, we can actually see the port of Singapore at the back. And in the more and later in the talk, you'll figure out why this is actually a bad location to put a UHF radio receiver. But coming back to the team, um, you can see Rob Beddington, our chief, uh, you know, systems engineer, is holding up a real-life model of, of Spooky One over there. Right now, the main motivation for this work um, actually is to do with the question of how one would actually build you know, a quantum communication network, not just QKD, but a quantum communication network that spans the globe. So um, this map over here shows you like how we are actually you know, linking up uh, our uh, conventional communications around the world. So in Singapore, I'm over here uh, in this corner of the world. And you know the signals that I'm sending to Zoom to you guys over at Illinois, go probably over the Pacific uh, to your location over here. Now, in, during the last uh, few meters from my computer to the router, it's in Singapore, it's Wi-Fi, but after that it's, it's optical fiber all the way. So optical fibers are actually very good for conventional communication, but actually they are not very good for quantum communication. And this is because they have exponential loss. The, the, the further you, know, you go, the less signal you receive. And after you know, essentially over a few hundred kilometers, you will not get any signal at all. Um, and you know, this is one problem that sort of vexes the community of people who think that quantum communications has applications. Uh, and if you want them, the applications to scale, you really want to be able to cover long distances. So this is spurring research in things like how to rebuild quantum memories, quantum repeaters, um, and also is driving a little bit of the research into why we are putting things in space. Now, of course, if you're using a satellite as a transmitter of some kind, uh, then you don't really have the problem of transmitting signals to optical fiber, which is a glass medium. Uh, essentially, most of the time, the signals on the satellite will be traveling to the vacuum of space, and then they will only see you know, the atmosphere over the last 10 kilometers or so. Um, and of course, you know, the atmosphere can actually be very turbulent. Uh, it can actually have problems like uh, fog, uh, clouds, or rain. And this can actually degrade your, your quantum signal. But you know, during the clear days when you can actually establish communications, then it's actually quite good. You can actually you know, um, cover a pretty wide swath of uh, the earth uh, with very low losses. And of course, you know, the, we know that this is possible, not just in theory, because our, our Chinese colleagues have been you know, running a lot of experiments on the Misha spacecraft. So Misha um, is about a 600 kilogram spacecraft. It carries a QKD transmitter. It carries single photon receivers. It carries an entangled photon pay source. And they've been you know, performing a lot of quantum communication primitives from space. Uh, for example, that did uh, you know, uh, QKD experiments in a downlink fashion from a satellite to a ground uh, receiver. And then what they did was then they, they used a satellite to fly around the world to another ground receiver and repeated the exercise. And now what the satellite can do is it acts as a trusted node uh, for quantum key distribution. Uh, more interestingly, the Misha satellite also has two telescopes. So if you have a quantum light source, an entangled photon source, which produces two photons at a time that share this very strong correlations, you can send each photon in the pair down to the two ground stations, right? And this is actually really nice. And they show that they could actually link up two optical ground stations uh, more than a thousand kilometers apart at a rate which was higher than if those 
two ground stations had been shared, uh, connected directly with an optical fiber. Now, um, if you talk about what you want to do in the future, uh, you might want to you know, have more complex satellite networks, and you might want to think of having um, you know, inter-satellite communications as well. Uh, and as far as I can tell, um, this scenario number four over here, where you're exchanging quantum signals between satellites, is still an outstanding problem that hasn't yet been demonstrated. So essentially, what, we can, what I want to you know, say is that using satellites in space, one can actually overcome the range problem uh, much more easily uh, right now. But of course, you know, if we have quantum memories and quantum repeaters, we can also put them in space as well so that you, know, you can actually have uh, a quantum network with a space segment to augment what you're building on the ground. So that's uh, one of the big motivations for, for studying how to do quantum communications from space. Now, when I started my research team uh, after I returned to Singapore, we started thinking about, you know, how could we actually make faster progress uh, in this field? Um, essentially, if you, you use a traditional space approach, um, the space programs, they're typically like big spacecraft because big spacecraft can have a lot of resources. You can have a lot of redundant systems on your spacecraft. So if one component fails, then you will actually be able to switch on another uh, redundant component. Um, and so this is typically the example that was taken by, by Mishis. Uh, Mishis is a 600 kilogram spacecraft. And over here in the picture on the left, this is a publicity photo from our Chinese colleagues showing the internal uh, components of the satellite before it was actually uh, you know, packed together uh, and you know, surrounded by solar panels and radios. Now, um, it's not easy for small research teams to be able to access uh, such large satellite systems or even for small countries to do that. So what worked in our favor when I started the, the lab back then was that at the same time as we were interested in getting to space, a new you know, technology was emerging out of the space sector called uh, a nanosatellite. And the most famous nanosatellites are CubeSats. These are a standardized platform uh, essentially, you know, composed of one liter units of, of satellites. So each single unit of a CubeSat is a 10 centimeter cube, and you can actually stack them together to form larger spacecraft. And the idea is that each individual uh, unit could actually survive on its own as a complete spacecraft with solar panels, batteries, radios, uh, and, you know, any small experiment that you can squeeze on top of it. And on this picture on the right over here, this is my research team building a three unit cube set. Okay. And I'll talk a little bit about how we actually get our quantum experiment inside this, this device. Um, the nice thing about cube sets is that number one, it's actually really a standard. So you can actually buy the components um, uh, from the web and they'll ship it to you. And then once you have those components, you have something to design towards. I, I find that one of the hardest challenges in designing uh, quantum technologies to be taken outside of the laboratory is that what should be the size, weight, and power that you design for? If you don't have, really have an envelope, then it becomes a little bit of a moving target. Uh, it, gets, it gets a little bit difficult to get everyone in the research team to you know, agree to the, the, the trade-offs. So having the, 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 the standardized CubeSat actually helps the design process quite a bit. The other thing about CubeSats is that because everything is standardized, they are carried on spacecraft in standard deployers. And just like how we ship goods around the world with standard you know, TEUs or, or containers, uh, having a standardized container actually helps the rocket launchers to actually de-risk a lot of the challenges. Because if they have a custom satellite, what they're worried about is that uh, the satellite might actually break up during launch and then affect the rest of the other satellites that they're carrying. But if everything came inside standardized containers, that problem is, is solved because you just have to get a, a container that is ex accepted by the, the rocket uh, launch people. And of course, a nice thing about having small satellites is that now you can pack lots of them together under, onto a single rocket, right? And then you can do uh, access a ride share service. And there's uh, you know, lots of uh, you know, service providers out there that will actually aggregate you know, large numbers of satellites and then they'll launch it together so that you know, everybody gets a, 
just pays a, a small fraction of the cost. So this actually allows uh, you know, us to actually begin to think about how to get interesting you know, technology into space that maybe 15 years ago was just not really possible. So this, this combination of you know, innovation that's coming out of the space sector has really helped us. So since 2010, uh, the development plan has been to try and understand CubeSats. Uh, we developed a correlated photon paste source and we, we, we deployed it on a small spacecraft called Galatia in 2015. So the correlated photon paste source on Galatia was based on spontaneous parametric down conversion. Um, and it, it produces photon paste and we have two single photon detectors on it. And we just wanted to see whether, you know, the way we put the SPDC source uh, together would actually survive the rigors of being launched into space and operating in space. Because operating in space in a vacuum uh, is actually not very challenging if you're just thinking of the vacuum alone because the, the vacuum properties in, in low of orbit is actually very dirty. Any of our friends who are doing ion trapping uh, or, or working with uh, you know, high, high quality vacuum systems, they are making vacuum systems that are much you know, more stringent than what's available in low Earth orbit. But the bigger problem would be radiation. And what we wanted to be sure about was that despite all the testing that you can do uh, on the ground by bringing components to say, you know, a proton chamber or any kind of uh, radiation uh, facility, it's still sort of not really mimicking the actual environment in space. Right? So one of the things that we wanted to do was see how somehow electronics components would, would operate. And so the, the, the idea of this ex small experiment on Galatia was to sort of de de -risk, to de-risk our bigger uh, objectives, which was to demonstrate an entangled photon pay source as a stepping stone to its more ambitious experiments where we can actually distribute you know, entangled photons between satellites or from the satellite to ground receivers. So 2015, uh, the satellite was actually pretty successful. Uh, and so we moved on to, to starting to build our own dedicated satellite and the entangled photon pay source, which we completed in 2019 and we, we launched to the space station and we started collecting data from it. Uh, and in the future, what we are, we are working on is that we would like to you know, upgrade the entangled photon pay source design that we have on Spooky One, uh, put it into more capable spacecraft that have telescopes so that we can actually begin to beam some of those entangled photons to receivers either on another satellite or on the ground. Um, and so this is what we are working on. So now I'm gonna switch gears here and start talking about the satellite itself and the experiment inside. So this is a cutaway model of the Spooky One satellite. It's a three unit satellite. And it's, it's covered with solar panels so that you know, the sun's radiation will charge up a battery. It has UHF antennas. And these antennas are typically, you know, before deployment, they're actually folded down uh, onto the chassis of the, the satellite and secured uh, using uh, fishing wire. And when we want to actually deploy the satellite, it's pushed out. And then the heater automatically turns on and it melts that fishing wire so that the antennas then spring up in, in, into position. So that's actually how we do it. And then on the one third of the satellite is dedicated to the rest of the avionics, like the onboard computer memory, uh, radio, and, and things like that. And then we have uh, two thirds of the satellite for the quantum experiment. Um, so we have a, 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 what we call a quantum payload here. Uh, it has a, a nickname, XPEX2. Uh, because this is like a little space mission and we like to give acronyms to everything. Um, I just want to call out um, to a particular structure that you can see over here. Um, this is an isostatic mount assembly that we uh, co-designed with our colleagues at uh, the University of New South Wales in Australia, uh, the, Can the Canberra branch. Uh, and this is a, a, a little mechanical structure which is supposed to decouple the experiment from the rest of the satellite body. And you'll see why we wanted to, to build this thing um, in a minute. Now, coming back to the experiment itself, what we want to do is demonstrate entangled photon generation in space conclusively, not just looking at you know, correlated photon pairs from 
spontaneous parametric down conversion, but to show that the, the photon pairs we are producing have polarization entanglement. Now, there are many degrees of freedom in which you can encode uh, entanglement. We chose polarization simply because it's actually easy uh, to manipulate, uh, and it seems to you know, survive propagation through the atmosphere pretty well. Um, and so this is uh, the layout of this experiment. If you start from the bottom, you see, first of all, the custom structure interface to the satellite body followed by the isostatic mount. And so this isostatic mount, if you look at it very carefully, these are just three very thin um, metal blades that is holding the um, optical bench. And what's happening is that it sort of decouples the expansion of the um, satellite chassis from the optical bench. Because if the chassis was in the sun and it got hot, um, then you'll expand. And what's going to happen is that this, this three um, blades will actually take up that expansion, you know, that, that slack. And if the, the chassis of the satellite were to contract, it would move in the other direction. And that sort of minimizes the amount of strain and stress that's actually you know, propagated to the optical bench. Now, if you move yeah. upwards, we have- oh, Paul had his hand raised, so I wanted to okay. give him a chance. Hi, hi, Alex. So I'm just curious, did you try doing this without the isostatic mount and does it basically mess everything up, the, the heating, the ex expansion and contractions? We did some modeling. Uh, we didn't actually do the experiment. We did the modeling. And yes, the modeling seems to, to suggest that it would have been very, very risky. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. So yeah. is there no active temperature control? Um, yeah, we we have a little heater here. You can see a little sheet heater, right? Um, so it turns out that it's it's not very cold and lower forward. Uh, it's 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 about you know minus five degrees to about fifteen degrees Celsius, um, and we put a sheet heater which provides two watts of heat just to warm up the optical bench a little bit because we de we design and assemble everything at room temperature, and our thinking was. We just wanted to be sure that uh, if things get misaligned, we could just heat everything back up to room temperature and perhaps it will work. But of course, we have found that uh, the design is actually stable enough such that even if it's colder or, or hotter, by, by 5 to 10 degrees, it's, it's actually still okay. Do you uh, monitor so the temperature? So like, what, what is the variation when it's in the sun and not in the sun? Oh, yeah, yeah. We, we, I'll, I'll come to that in, yeah, in one okay. of my slides later. But we have thermistors. We have thermistors um, next to the laser diode here. Uh, we have one thermistor in the center near the crystals. And we have one thermistor for each of the single photon detectors. So we know the temperature. Um, so we, we do monitor it. And I guess um, let's, let's move on. So this electronics board, um, there's a small um, elect electrical insulation. And then this is the optical bench. And then to make it light tight, we have a, a small cover that comes down and then um, it's not screwed very tightly because if you screw it very tightly, then you, you, you worry now that the, this light tight cover, if the temperature changes, it will again stress and strain uh, the optical bench. So what we do is it, it's very loosely attached like a tent, you know, it's draped on top of this. And then on the bottom edges, we just use uh, aluminum tape. And then that that's makes it very light tight. Um, uh, an interesting thing that we, we decided to do uh, as general practice is to have a, a, a little valve here. And this valve is, uh, is closed, so it's light tight. But typically, there's a little valve here so that any gases that are trapped in here can escape. Uh, because what we are afraid of is creating some kind of pressurized chamber when, when the experiment gets into space. Now, if you look at the, the layer of this optical bench, it's a standard um, you know, entangled photon pair source uh, that is generated from spontaneous parametric down conversion. You start with a pump laser at four or five nanometers. Uh, we get our pump lasers from Ondax. Um, they seem to work very well in space. Um, and then we pump two crystals that produces uh, photon pairs each. And what we do is we make sure that they are mixed in a way such that you can't tell from which crystal they decay from. And then that gets you your, your entanglement. Um, and then they, they propagate. And then we separate the entangled photons according to their color. 
Now, there's one little device over here that we didn't show, um, which removes the pump light. And then the pump light is actually sent to uh, a photodiode. It's not a quadrant photodiode. It's a lateral effect photodiode, which um, can do the same thing. It actually you know, is able to tell you what is the centroid of the beam falling on it. And so using this, this, this device, we can actually monitor whether the laser beam has been misaligned. Um, so this is a, a sort of a sanity check in case we don't see any entangled photons. We want to be able to tell whether it was because something upstream uh, of the detectors had, had gotten misaligned. Um, now, coming back to the entangled photons, they would propagate this way to a dichroic mirror. Uh, we're generating them at different colors. So they're, they're split according to signal and idler. Uh, they will come down to this detector for the signal and for the idler, it goes to this detector. And then what we have in front of these detectors is a polarization analyzer. Um, so essentially a, a very high quality uh, polarizing beam splitter. Uh, and in front of that uh, polarization, polarization rotator. Now, um, typically in the lab, right, you would actually rotate your polarization using a wave plate uh, on a motorized mount. Uh, but the space engineers, they hate that. They don't like you know, moving components because they worry about destabilizing um, you know, the, the satellite, especially since it's so small. So what we did was we actually used a, a liquid crystal device just to rotate it. Um, and at first, we were concerned that liquid crystal uh, devices would degrade very rapidly uh, in space because of radiation effects. But uh, from the Galatia experiment, you know, that original Pathfinder experiment, we, we saw that the liquid crystal devices uh, were actually quite robust. And that gave us the confidence to continue using it in, inside Spooky. Now, coming back to uh, you know, some of the other things that we had to do to address the unique uh, thermal environment in space is that this satellite is going to be in low Earth orbit. So typically a low Earth orbit satellite would spend about 60 minutes in the sun and about 30 minutes in the Earth's shadow or the eclipse. And then this, this behavior of you know, 60 minutes, 30 minutes, uh, is sort of consistent throughout the year, except that the satellite is also precessing around the Earth. So there are certain times of the year, right, when the orbits line up in such a way that you don't get this regular uh, daytime and eclipse. In fact, what's happening is that there is no eclipse and the sun is, uh, the satellite is continuously illuminated. Um, and so we deployed sometime in June and you can see that very quickly before, uh, very quickly after that, we will enter one of these conditions which we call the high beta angle condition. And so we wanted to try and get as much data as we can before the satellite entered this point because we weren't sure whether it would survive that. Um, so we had to do certain tricks, for example, uh, this is one of the main motivations of why we came up with the isostatic mount, right? To actually sort of um, reduce the strain and stress between the externals of the satellite and the internals. Uh, we also had to try and make sure that we were, you know, orienting the, the crystals um, with um, strong enough uh, flexure stages. Because the way we do face matching in this device is, is, is critical critically face match, so it's angle tuned, right? So the, the crystals have an optical axis, they need to maintain a very fine angle to the uh, pump beam that's coming in. Uh, and so we had to design our own you know, flexure stages to keep the crystals in place, just to, to get that additional uh, you know, assurance. So this is one of the, 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 the big challenges that we had. Now coming back to the design of the, uh, Entangled photon pay source itself. This is a close up look um, at the two crystals that we had. So, actually, when I said that this was you know, a standard you know, source based on spontaneous parametric down conversion, yes, it's based on SPDC, but the orientation of the crystals was actually kind of unique in the sense that um, in the past, when um, some colleagues in Germany tried to do a collimated entangled photon pay source, our two crystals, they had a cross crystal regime. Uh, it means that the first crystal uh, optical axis was at 90 degrees to the uh, optical axis of the second crystal. Um, and that worked, but we found that that wasn't very reliable uh, for what we, we wanted. We wanted something much more robust. 
And when I say robust, I mean, we wanted something where we, we could collect from any way within the admission cone and still see that it was highly entangled. So that drove us to, to make this particular design where you take, you take two crystals, uh, beta barium borate, you make the optical axis parallel, right? And so what happens is that the pump beam comes in, it undergoes spatial walk-off, and it's generating down conversion photons at the same time. The spatial mode is given by this uh, red ellipse. Then all the light goes to a half-wave plate that rotates the polarization of these photons. Uh, and so now we, we call this uh, the green photons, right? Because the polarization has been rotated. Now this is type one phase matching. So now the photons in this ellipse over here have the same polarization as the polarization of pump because the half-wave plate only acts on the SPDC, it doesn't act on the pump. Uh, and so now they both undergo spatial walk-off. And in the second crystal, when you're undergoing spatial walk-off, the photon pairs would again have the same you know, spatial mode, but now they're very closely aligned with the photon mode from the first crystal. And so spatially, they are actually you know, very close. And you take care of the other uh, distinguishing parameters like phase, then on the outside, you actually can collect photon pairs from anywhere within this uh, optical mode, and they will give you something very close to this uh, entangled state. So, so this, is, this allows us to have some kind of redundancy in the sense that um, if something in the collection side on the detector side got misaligned, and we were looking not at the center of the mode, but somewhere towards the edges, we should still be able to see correlations, uh, entanglement correlations. So, um, and this works because on, on, on the ground, we, we started to play around with the, the size of the iris uh, that transmits these photons. We also played around with different crystal lengths. And you can see that, you know, we could actually generate um, entangled photons with uh, quite a good fidelity to the canonical states um, as, as you increase the, the iris size. Uh, and so this brightness here is just another proxy for iris size. Uh, but it's nice to see that we can get hundreds of thousands of, of photon pairs for every milliwatt of pump power that we were using. Now, coming to um, how the, the you know, uh, components were actually put together, uh, there's a laser diode over here, there's a the crystals, um, this is the dichroic that splits the down conversion photons. And then what we did was we just let them fall you know, directly onto the detector without using any uh, focusing optics. Um, because you know what we wanted to do at this stage was not to test out focusing optics, but just to make sure that we can actually demonstrate polarization entanglement generation. So if you were to look at the um, scatter plot uh, down here, the green area would be the active area of the detectors. And then the scatter plot is sort of like, you know, the, the volume of the SPDC photons that were falling around it. So you can see that we, we collect only a fraction of it. Now the ground segment, um, this is not quantum. This is just uh, UHF radio antennas. Um, we have two actually, two identical ones. And there's one in Switzerland uh, run by our colleague, uh, Christoph Walfuer. Elizabeth actually knows Christoph because we were all you know, uh, working at NIST at the same time. Um, and so um, what we, the reason why we have two ground stations is not only because we were thinking that uh, if the satellite were to fly over two places, we could actually collect more, more data. Uh, we could download more data uh, for, for anal analysis. But the other problem was that um, the radio uh, environment in Singapore is not very good because this is based on UHF radio technology. It's a pretty old technology. Uh, lots of people use it now. And, you know, our ground station in Singapore oversees the port of Singapore, which is one of the busiest ports in the world. And lots of sailors actually use that uh, frequency. And it doesn't seem to be controlled very well because it creates a huge amount of background noise. Um, and so typically we can only communicate with the satellite when it's not on the horizon, but flying directly overhead. So we're actually really happy to have Christoph in Switzerland uh, where you know, his university is in a very quiet uh, valley with very little noise and we can actually use it most of the time to download our data. Now, um, 
So what we've done is, you know, we've actually packed everything together, tested it, and it was ready. And then we deployed uh, from the space station. Um, so before it went to the space station, it was put on, it was sent to Japan uh, for, you know, final uh, testing because the Japanese space agency actually provided us a, a very low cost uh, way to get into space. And they had to make sure that the satellite, uh, you know, met all the requirements. And then it was shipped to the U.S., uh, to be put onto a space uh, station resupply rocket, which then brought it up to the space station. And then Spooky spent um, a couple of months resting on the space station before the astronauts had time to deploy it. Uh, so this was the, the, the photo of the final team, uh, you know, uh, at the time we shipped it to Japan. So I'm gonna take a small break here to, to see whether there's questions from anyone before I move on to the results. So there's nothing in the chat. I had a question um, from early on. You you said early on that the um, you weren't aware of satellite to satellite communication having been worked out by anyone, um, but that actually to some extent sounds easier because there's no turbulence. What are the what are the challenges of satellite to satellite communication that I'm not thinking of? Okay, so um, I, maybe I should, should should strengthen the argument here in the sense that. Classical satellite the satellite communication has been done. I'm not uh, aware of anyone doing quantum intersatellite communication. And you are you're actually uh, absolutely right. There is no turbulence. It's actually easier, um, especially if you were to uh, you know, deploy the satellites together and then just have them slowly drift apart, right? Then they are mostly in the same orbits. They're tracking each other. It would be a much bigger challenge if um, the satellites were in different orbits. For example, if they were, they were going to be crossing and the speeds will actually be quite high, the relative speeds can be quite high. And um, it's not com I'm not completely sure if you can actually swivel uh, you know, your, your telescopes to track that quickly. Um, but you know, this is just a quantum physicist speaking. Uh, <laughs> Space satellite engineers may differ in your opinion. Um, I do know that um, the European Space Agency has something called um, uh, the European um, EDLS, European Data Relay System in Space, uh, which actually is linking up geostationary spacecraft with spacecraft in, um, in MEO, and also linking up spacecraft in LEO, and also to, to ground stations on Earth. So in that sense, there is already existing technology for classical comms. Um, and the question would be whether we can actually use that uh, for quantum communication. Um, so um, I think the Max Planck Institute for, for Light in uh, Erlangen, they did a really nice experiment a couple of years ago where they took one of these geostationary transmitters for classical light. Um, and then they actually studied its, its, its properties. This was for uh, homodyne measurements. Um, there was, this was for homodyne measurements. And, and they showed that the noise on some of those transmitters is actually compatible with quantum uh, communications. And in particular for their case, for, for QKD. Uh, it's just that there was not enough um, basis choice elements that had been installed on the satellite at that time because they weren't thinking of that. They were just thinking of classical comms. Cool, thanks. Yeah, um, maybe I'll just move on. Uh, can I have a question? Oh, sure. Uh, you mentioned that uh, when you collect uh, the output photon from the SPDC, the distribution of the output photons are larger than the detector size. Just can you say it again, what's the benefit of doing that? Um, so there's no benefit of doing that if you're interested in an application. So typically, let me just go back to that slide. So you, you, if you are interested in an application, you would put a lens over here to focus the SPDC light down to an optical fiber or to an aperture of a telescope, okay? Um, so this is what you would do if you wanted to do an application. But the, the mission of this experiment on Spooky One is not for an application. We're not transmitting the signals out of the satellite. All we want to do is to see that we can actually generate polarization in tangled photons on the spacecraft itself. So it turned out to be just easier to let it, you know, over 
uh, over illuminate the active area of the detectors. Thank you. Okay, so moving on. Um, so, you know, Elizabeth was asking a question about um, temperatures on the spacecraft. So you're looking at one of these temperatures over here. Um, so this is a data set from one of the first times when we talked to Spooky. Uh, this is uh, the temperature on, I think, near one of the detectors. And you can see that during the day time, uh, you know, the temperature will, would reach about minus five degrees Celsius. And then, you know, it starts to heat up because it collects more and more energy from, 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 from daylight. Um, and then when it starts to enter the Earth's eclipse, Although the outer part of the satellite starts to cool down, the amount of heat that's inside the satellite continues to leak onto the uh, experiment itself so that the peak temperature is actually within the eclipse and not within the daytime. Okay? So this is, is actually how, how it differs. Um, and you can also see that you know, the temperature is relatively low between minus 5 degrees Celsius uh, and 10 degrees Celsius. Um, and, and this is the typical range of temperature that you will see if you don't have an active heater on, on the satellite. Uh, but this is not good for us because you know, one of the conditions that we wanted to set for ourselves was that we would run experiments only if the temperature was above 15 degrees Celsius because um, it turns out that the on-dex laser diodes typically do not like to be run very cold. Um, and and you, you want to run them at a higher temperature. So we spent a lot of time in the first few days, you know, uh, studying the orbits, you know, for example, in this white board over here, you can see us, you know, trying to predict when the orbits were going to happen um, and when the eclipse times were happening so that we could decide when to turn on the heater and when to experiment. Uh, so this was actually kind of fun. And, and one of the reasons why we couldn't do this more accurately is because the satellite itself, right, has a detumbling mechanism based on the magnetic field of the Earth. And this is not a very, how should I put it this way? It's not a very sophisticated device. It's called a B-dot controller. It senses the rate of change of the magnetic field of the Earth, and it'll try and detumble the, the satellite. But what it does is it also tries to present different faces of the uh, satellite to the sun uh, in a way to try and average out the temperature. But because it's not predictable, Sometimes the short face of the sun, yeah, the short face of the satellite, the small face, will spend more time looking at the sun than the long face. And they can actually, you know, affect your, your temperature curves over here by up to like, you know, five degrees up and down. Uh, so this is actually one of the, the uh, big challenges that we, we had to try and overcome. Uh, but no, having said that, we managed to identify when we could turn on the heater uh, and for example, how many orbits do we have to turn on the heater before we can run the experiment? And we can actually get uh, pretty nice, um, you know, correlation curves that look like this. So what you're looking at here is, you know, photon pair curves. Um, so let me rephrase that. What you're looking at here is, you know, the coincidence count rates from the two detectors, right? Um, as we change the basis settings of one of the polarizing analyzers. Uh, in one arm. So typically, for example, if you set the signal arm to, to be H, you then scan the idler arm, uh, and then you see what the correlation curves look like. Now, these correlation curves, you know, typically uh, the way we are doing it, because it's not a very high efficiency collection device, there is a background, but we can estimate what the background, that accidental background is, uh, because we know our timing window and we know the rate of single events on the detectors. And we can actually correct for that. And once we correct for that, we see we have these high contrast curves in space and uh, on the ground. And they're actually kind of comparable. So this actually tells us that we are actually able to generate polarization entangled photons on the satellite. Um, and not only that, we can also see what is the equivalent CH SH parameter. Um, so over here, you can see that um, this is the set of CHSH parameters we've observed uh, over a range of working temperatures. Okay, and we, we, we published this in our paper last year. Um, and, and it turns out that one of the fun things about how we could actually do this was because we also understood 
what was the correct laser carbon to use at each temperature. It turns out that the Ontex laser um, would, would mod hop slightly, and there's slight changes in the pump wavelength with different temperatures. Um, and so you can actually, you know, we, what we did on the ground was we turned on the, the laser and then we scanned its temperature and its current, and we, we tried to observe what was the, you know, the contrast of those polarization curves at each of those uh, settings. And then from there, we can actually use it as a lookup table when we're operating in space. So this, is, this turns out to actually have been quite, quite a useful thing. Now, these red data points over here are also kind of interesting because this was the first set of um, you know, CH, SH uh, values that we observed after the satellite had left this um, high beta angle condition. So remember, we, we, we were deployed from the space station here. We did all the first experiments in this time gap, and then we couldn't do anything because the satellite got too warm. But after we recovered and was in this time gap, we did the experiments again, and we saw that we, we could actually get back um, high quality entanglement. Um, and so we've been operating um, the satellite, uh, you know, more or less continuously since then. Uh, and this is, shows all the, you know, CH, SH values that we have obtained um, up to January this year, actually, right? Um, there was a, a, a small region in time when we actually didn't actually run any of these experiments, primarily because uh, the grounds, the radios that were, we were using, the two ground stations, uh, they actually had technical problems and we couldn't actually communicate with the satellite. So it was actually kind of nice to see that, you know, uh, up to 600 days, uh, we are still actually operational and we're still collecting more data. Hey, Alex. Yeah. Uh, Paul's got another question. Okay. Uh, on your um, needing to change the diode, the, the current on the diode laser to, to fix the wavelength, the mode hopping, I'm wondering if you could avo avoid, the issue is basically that the different frequencies are producing different phases between the two terms, right? Between H yes. and VV. Uh, typically, so I'm not used to thinking about the, the collinear sources, but at least in the non-collinear sources, if you do a little bit of comp post compensation, you can, you can make a source that is broadband. So the issue is that the, you know, the colors are walking off a little bit. I'm wondering if, if that's possible here, if there's a thing you could put in, a fixed element you could put in that would enable you to, to <coughs> fix that without needing to change the current. Yeah, so we, we, we talked about that. And I think in this particular collinear setup, we, we didn't have a way of, of doing that. Um, what we're thinking of doing in the future is perhaps we might put in, um, uh, you know, the post compensation crystal. We might mount it actually on uh, a flexure stage that has a piezo element that we could actually just move it slightly, mm -hmm. um, and that might actually correct for all these phase changes due to temperature change. So that's that's another way to do it, and that would be. The advantage there would be, it would be, you know, you can correct in real time quickly. We are having to try to predict what the temperature was. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Right. Okay. Now I want to uh, move on a little bit to some of our more recent results. So we're, we're pretty happy that we can actually see uh, entanglement generation on the small satellite. Uh, and it's, and so that's the primary objective. And the secondary objective is again to see, you know, uh, what's the effects of radiation on the components, right? Uh, we had something on Galatia that was nice, but Galatia was a special orbit. Um, it's actually an equatorial orbit. Um, uh, and this means that the satellite never sees the North Pole and the South Pole. It only goes around the equator all the time. Uh, and you can see in this radiation heat map over here, uh, there are very strong, you know, radiation events uh, at the North Pole and South Pole. And there's also something called the South Atlantic Anomaly, uh, where there's a, a region of, of strong radiation over there. Um, and so what we wanted to see is, you know, given that Spooky 1 is in a different uh, orbit from Galatia, it's essentially following the International Space Station, 
what would be the effect of the radiation damage, right? And the other interesting thing is that the satellite is not in a consistent orbit because it would slowly degrade, right? And actually burn up in the Earth's atmosphere at some point. Now, at this point, I have to say Spooky One has outlived uh, its uh, intended or planned lifetime by one year, uh, almost one year. Uh, and we're, we're, we're actually pretty happy about that. But it is still falling and it will fall down, you know, and burn up at some point. Um, and what's going to happen as you fall in altitude is that these hot spots, right, they will get smaller and smaller in size. Um, and, and we know that because at the surface of the Earth, you know, there's hardly any of this radiation. So we wanted to see whether we could actually observe the effects of this. And the way we do that is by looking at the single photon detectors. It turns out that of all the elements that we have on board, the single photon detectors are actually the most sensitive to radiation because high energy particles would actually uh, damage the active area, they create intermediate energy levels uh, in, the, in, in the energy gap. And then um, they lead to trap charges that live for a long time. Uh, and so what happens is that even if you make the detectors very dark and don't shine any light on it, they will give off you know, avalanche pulses and, they'll, and you, they think that they have seen an event. Actually, what's, that, what's happening is that it's just thermal you know, electrons getting promoted up into the conduction band and creating an avalanche. Um, so we call this the dark counts. And we know that the dark count rate of damage detectors will always increase. And what you're looking at over here is for our two detectors and for three different temperatures at one degree, five degree, and 10 degrees. And we, what we do is we monitor the dark count rate uh, on days we are not doing the entanglement experiment. And you can see that there's actually a nice linear trend uh, in how the dark count rates increase, right? Uh, with time all the way up to about you know, 400 days. And then as the, you know, at this, at this point over here where there's a knee and the satellite starts to drop in altitude much more quickly, we see that the, there's a different rate of increase of the radiation damage, which is the dark count rate. And so this is actually kind of nice. It, it sort of tells us that uh, what's happening in the radiation environment on the satellite is sort of consistent uh, with our understanding of how the radiation changes uh, at different parts of the atmosphere. Um, and we, we also know that this effect, um, this is a bit more of an instrumentation slide. We also know that this effect where um, the count rates, the dark count rates is not increasing rapidly anymore. It is not due to a, a breakdown or failure of how we're operating the detector. Uh, and you know, excuse me if this is a little bit too technical, but those of you who, who actually build circuits for single photon detectors might find this interesting because what you're looking at over here is a passively quenched single photon detector. This is what we use on Spooky. And what happens is that when the um, detector gives us an avalanche, typically you would have a sense resistor and then this avalanche pulse is detected by a discriminator, right? And typically we just have one sense resistor and one discriminator. What we did on Spooky was we split the sense resistor into, into two. So there were two sense resistors and two discriminators, and the discriminators had different reference voltages. So now what's happening is that a single event will have a, a pulse at the top and a pulse at the bottom, right? They will be of different heights according to the voltage divider. Um, and what you do is you compare the ratio at which you're counting the bottom counts to the top counts. Now the top counts have a very low reference voltage. So all, all the events that happen at the detector are counted at the top level. Uh, we, we are more discriminating with the bottom pulse. Uh, we typically set it much higher so that only a fraction of the bottom counts actually get counted. And so in this way, we are able to, to sort of say, okay, we'll have a control circuit that aims to fix the ratio of the bottom to top counts by adjusting the applied voltage. Uh, we call this the BTR, right? And in a well-behaving detector, uh, this, this bottom to top ratio should always be fixed uh, at its nominal value. For us, the nominal value is 0 0.5. Now, if there was something going wrong, for example, the detector was getting saturated, uh, there was not enough voltage being applied, 
then the BTR will either shoot towards one, where the number of top counts and bottom counts is the same, or it will fall towards zero. And these are usually events of you know, saturation in the detector or something misbehaving inside the detector operating circuit. But what we're seeing is that all the way up to 600 days, when we see that dark count rate of the detector saturating, the, the bottom to top ratio is actually you know, consistent. It's at its nominal value. And so that gives us confidence that what we're observing is really uh, the effect of you know, a reduced rate of radiation damage. Okay, so I've kind of you know, stopped uh, now with the latest results. And those results that I shared with you just now about the rate of radiation damage, they're really very fresh. Uh, those graphs, I just actually you know, uh, had them uh, this week actually. Um, but now what I want to move on is move on to talk about some of the things that we want to do next. Um, so Spooky One is uh, you know, a proof of concept experiment. Entangled photons have been generated in the satellite. Now we want to transmit them out of the spacecraft. Uh, and in order to do that, you need a telescope. And you also need a telescope they can you know, lock on to an optical ground station, right? And also have the ability to uh, point uh, very finely. So typically what happens is that you would use cost mechanisms like uh, reaction wheels to orientate the attitude of the satellite to face the, the ground station. And then the final correction is done by fine staring mirrors. And the question is, how would you actually put that together into a small package that fits onto CubeSats? Uh, so we, we had a, a, a collaboration um, formed between three groups. And, and what we did at CQT was we, we sort of you know, provided the umbrella for these people to work together. So there was a Kerry Cahoy's group at MIT. Um, there's a group at University of Arizona designing the telescope. And our spin-off company that was Spectral was trying to do the systems engineering for everything. And what you're seeing over here is that this is a telescope. And this is the fine pointing mechanism uh, that Kerry's team came up with. right? And it could actually, it's actually quite small. And it can actually be bolted onto the back end of the telescope. And once you, have, you put everything together, including the control electronics for the fine pointing mechanism, um, it fits really comfortably inside what we call a 12U satellite. So a satellite composed out of 12 units of CubeSats, right? Uh, or four times larger than uh, Spooky One. So this actually is very promising. Uh, we actually kind of like this, this design and it's one of those designs that we are following up with to see whether we can use it in future follow-up missions. Um, now, what other things should people think about uh, or what should they study uh, in the future when we think about going beyond having one satellite or two satellites to talk to? So I guess this is more about, you know, when we reach the point where quantum communication actually becomes a real application and you want to start thinking about, you know, service uh, rates. Uh, and so one of the questions sometimes people think about when they come to the field is that, oh, low of orbit satellites are interesting, but you know, the fact that they fly overhead uh, very quickly, right? So you need a very complicated tracking mechanism for your ground receiver. The other, other thing is that the satellite is not overhead all the time. It typically only flies overhead uh, two or three times in a 24 hour period. So it's not persistent. And so people sometimes are tempted to think about geostationary satellites. And so these this graphs here are sort of a, a way of, of telling you that you might want to rethink using geostationary satellites because of diffraction losses. So on, on this graph on the left, uh, this is the rate at which you can generate um, a quantum signal. Uh, we call it a raw key here because it was done in the context of quantum key distribution. But you can see that for low of orbit satellites, this would be a nominal rate at which you would be Generate, uh, distributing quantum signals to the ground. And then you go to a geostationary satellite at 36,000 kilometers, you would be down here. So you have to think very carefully about whether you want to have the persistence and how you're going to overcome the diffraction losses. Now, you zoom in on this region over here, you'll see that uh, there is a, a, a point where the geostationary orbit has an advantage over some other orbits, but only, you know, uh, up to 20,000 kilometers. Anything, you know, at a range altitude that's less than 20,000 kilometers is always going to outperform 
the geostationary satellite. Uh, of course, having said that, um, I've heard of you know some ideas where people are talking about building really, really large receivers, uh, which don't have to move to track anything. Uh, they, they just have to move very slowly to, to follow the uh, small wobbles of the geostationary satellite. If one could actually build such such receivers, uh, perhaps you know the way we are looking at these graphs will change. Uh, but this is just you know an important point to think about if we're thinking about how to optimize. Uh, you know, service delivery from, from space. Now, and beyond that, you know, I guess one could think about how to study constellations of satellites. Uh, we, my group published a, a small paper uh, last year about, you know, what is the best uh, constellation of satellites you would use if you want to target a particular distribution of, uh, you know, ground receivers. So for example, if you, you think of um, targeting ground receivers distributed around the Mediterranean as compared to a bunch of ground receivers in Southeast Asia, which is more like a circular blob, then it turns out that perhaps, you know, uh, there's no one size fits all constellation that delivers the same rate of key delivery or, or quantum signals to the, the, the two different ground stations. So, Having, having some kind of consideration on those things is actually kind of important. And of course, the other thing is um, we should start thinking about putting quantum memories in space as well, because um, this, this paper, uh, this preprint actually, uh, you know, suggested that if you were to um, put, uh, you know, quantum memories and, and, uh, and operate them in the right way, you can actually, you know, really build a, a really long range quantum communication system without, um, well, in the context of QKD, it doesn't have to be a trusted node. And that's actually kind of interesting. So, um, you know, and I guess just to close out, I just want to say that this is probably a good time to work on quantum stuff in space uh, because there's quite a bit of activity going on now. Uh, the Coal Atom Laboratory uh, on the ISS uh, has started reporting, you know, the generation and production of Bose-Einstein condensates. Uh, there's also some advanced atomic clock experiments that's going to run on the ISS pretty soon. Uh, coming back to quantum comms, um, there's actually a couple of big spacecraft that's going to be demonstrating uh, quantum communications, um, particularly QKD. Um, so there's KeySat from, from our Canadian colleagues. Uh, that our Chinese colleagues are planning you know, follow-on missions to missions. The European Space Agency has multiple programs uh, called QKD SAT and QUADS. And, and even you know, with small satellites like CubeSats, there's a Cube mission from Germany uh, and rocks on the United Kingdom. And there's probably going to be a couple of others uh, popping up as well. So it's actually you know, an exciting time to see all these experiments happening from space. Um, and I just want to, you know, end my talk here with one last experiment that uh, my group is doing with uh, a German group at Humboldt University led by Markus Kutzig. And this has to do with uh, the idea of putting quantum memories in space. Because if you want to put any kind of atomic system, you probably want to have a narrow uh, atomic reference that you can actually lock the laser to. Um, and typically what you do is you do uh, atomic spectroscopy. And so with Marcus, what we're thinking of is how would we build one of these uh, spectroscopic devices to actually fit it onto a CubeSat? Uh, they've been over in Germany, they've been working on uh, the optics itself. Uh, this is a model for a 1U CubeSat. And what we're doing is we're supporting them with the electronics for that. Um, and so there, there's a, you know, a, a paper that's under review at, at this point in time. Um, and this, I just want to end by saying that, you know, I've talked a lot about uh, what, I, what the team has done. I couldn't have done this without, you know, the, the students, uh, the three PhD students who contributed a lot, like, um, you know, Rakita, who actually built electronics for, for Spooky One, uh, Tsongkhan and Aito, who actually built the Entangled Photon Pay Source. Um, and some of our team members actually went off to join the spin-off company. Uh, and our collaborators, Christoph, Daniel, uh, and Douglas, and also our reviewers. And it turns out that having people to review your, your, your space experiments, even if they're not quantum people, has turned out to be very interesting because 
uh, there's always, you know, personal anecdote. This is, there's always the temptation for mission creep where we, you want to add on more and more objectives onto the spacecraft. Uh, and actually, you know, in, in retrospect, that's actually not a good idea, right? And it's really good to have uh, reviewers who will actually tell you uh, before you have to learn that painful lesson and that you should avoid mission creep. Uh, and so with that, I'd like to you know, end my talk and see whether there's any questions. Thanks a lot, Alex. That was a great talk. Super interesting. Um, you've got some applause hands. Does anyone have any questions? Go ahead and unmute yourself. So if you go back a couple of slides, yes. um, to you had like a schematic from that archive paper. Yeah. So, oh. no, keep going. Sorry, the um, one more. Yeah. Uh, no. This this one, right? <laughs> no, uh, the one with the like uh, networks of satellites. The one, the one with the. Ah, networks. okay, okay. Um. So I see there that you have nonchalantly written that you have quantum non-demolition measurements um, at your ground stations. Do you have a, a, a sense of how you would do that? Or do no, have... I don't think so. I think this, this paper, which uh, uh, I'm not part of this paper, right? Uh, okay. This is a preprint paper from some of my colleagues that I talked to. Um, I, I don't think they actually know how it would be implemented. Um, I think we were just talking about it before the, the seminar started about you know, how you actually require uh, not just a simple link like this, but you actually require a lot of other supporting technology like adaptive optics, right? So those things are also going to be uh, important. But you're right, uh, this is a very simple cartoon and uh, they're non <laughs> non uh, written Q and D. Okay. Just curious. Um, it looks like we've got a couple hands up. Maybe Andrew. Um, hi, Professor Ling. Thanks for your talk. Um, my question has to do with uh, SpaceX's plans for the Starlink constellation. Um, they're wanting to produce upwards of 40,000 satellites in low Earth orbit. And while they want to have uplinks and downlinks in RF, uh, they're planning to have a laser based um, backbone to connect the satellites. And I was just curious, did you have any thoughts on whether or not uh, that could be used for uh, including quantum communications in the future? Yeah, I, I think that's a great question. It's really exciting to see all this, um, you know, Leo constellations being built. Um, most of them are targeting RF, as, as you say. Some of them are talking about optical. Um, and I think there is a way to see whether we can actually make use of that for quantum comms. Um, but I would like to um, just you know, say one caveat. Conventional laser comms from satellites typically is very inefficient. So they will actually blast you know, high power lasers and use very sensitive detectors. That's how they actually overcome um, the fine pointing requirement. So they can live with um, very small transmitters. So for example, uh, when we were trying to think about how we were going to do quantum comms on the satellite, we were approached by a couple of these uh, classical comms, you know, satellite people. And they said, don't worry, we'll solve your problem. We've got a transmitter for you. And then the transmitter is like a one centimeter aperture, right? Uh, with, you know, a, a fine pointing accuracy of maybe 50 to 60 micro radians which is actually pretty good for classical comms. But it turns out that if you use those parameters, like one centimeter transmitter at 400 kilometers, with a 50 or 60 micro radian uh, you know, pointing accuracy, you might actually you know, end up with very low quantum signal falling onto your, your detector. So there, there is a trade-off that, that has to be done over here. Either we, we had to find a way uh, to increase the robustness with which we transmit the quantum signals, or we have to improve the, 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 the pointing accuracy of the classical comms devices. At the same time, there's no escaping the fact that you probably need much larger optics because this is physics. It's, it's not something that you can uh, overcome by you know, doing better software, for example. So I think there is some, some 
some lessons to be learned uh, about, about how they operate the constellations, but the technical uh, aspects still really have to be improved. Okay, thank you. All right. Well, in the interest of time, uh, I think that's probably it. Thanks a lot, Alex. This was great. Um, thanks everyone for coming and hopefully next time I'll see you in person. Yeah.